I would like to thank the sponsor of today's episode, The Keystone Group. The Keystone Group is a results-oriented management consulting firm. Using small, experienced teams, they help mid-market manufacturing, distribution, and service companies develop and execute strategy, improve operational performance, restructure finances, and when it comes to mergers and acquisitions, their team can help you with the assessment, planning, and integration. I recently had the pleasure of interviewing Jeff Alvis of the Keystone Group, and they have helped countless companies avoid the pitfalls and maximize the value of their acquisitions. If you're in need of rapid and sustainable results, don't hesitate to reach out to the Keystone Group at thekeystonegroup.com and hope you enjoyed today's episode. Looking to buy, sell, or grow your business to position it for a sale? As the owner and managing partner of Sun Acquisitions, Dominic Rinaldi has personally been involved in over 300 M&A transactions. He has seen and done it all, consulting with large and small businesses across a broad range of industries. On M&A Unplugged, he'll interview buyers, sellers, and their advisors about their experiences scaling, selling, and acquiring businesses. On every episode, you will get key learnings, but most importantly, you will be better prepared for your own acquisition or sale. This is M&A Unplugged with your host, Dominic Rinaldi. In this environment of cybersecurity, data breaches, and just leveraging your data to have a competitive advantage, it's so important to have a data strategy. And how does the concept of data leadership factor into mergers and acquisitions? How should data quality, security risks, and infrastructure assessments be handled during M&A transactions? What are the problems you run into if you don't evaluate these components before taking your business to market or acquiring a business? We are being joined today by a nationally recognized data leader and published author on this topic, Anthony Algeman. Anthony, welcome to M&A Unplugged. Thanks, Dominic. It's great to be here. Yeah, so I'm excited to get into this because I think I'm going to learn a bunch from you. Data is something that I think has become much more mainstream in the last five to seven years, especially with cybersecurity and data breaches. But let's start at the base level. When I hear the word data, and I think when most business owners hear the word data, I think it seems like this big albatross you're not quite certain how to get your arms around what that is. And it almost seems like such a big topic. I think a lot of people ignore it just because it comes across as being such a big topic. So what's your definition of data and how should people view it so that it doesn't seem like such a daunting piece of their business? Dominic, the way I think about it, and I think this is a useful definition for kind of all business owners out there, is that data is the closest thing to truth we have inside our businesses. And data can take on forms of whether you're talking financial statements or you're talking about operations and manufacturing assessments, or you're talking about cash flows, or you're talking about personnel and files and anything that has information in it, it's through the understanding and application of that information, of that knowledge, that our businesses actually function in many ways. And it's a cliche to say, but it is the lifeblood of organizations. You don't really have a functioning business without data. And really, we're all information workers. We're using data all the time. We're just not necessarily labeling it as such. I love that. Data is the closest thing to truth in your business. I'm going to borrow that if you don't mind. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) So let's take an even further step back. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about your background and how you got to this point in your career. And then let's dive into how data impacts mergers and acquisitions from a seller's perspective, from a buyer's perspective. What are some of the best practices We'll go and explore all of that. But let's start a little bit about you. Right. So my background's a little bit interesting to be doing what I'm doing now. And I think it's given me a perspective that few in my kind of data management community space really have. And the first decade or so of my career, and prior to that, you know, I've always been a fan of business, entrepreneurial, and loved commerce and finance and things like that. But when I got into the marketplace after graduating undergrad with a business degree, I said, I want to do something that impacts business and and helps it get better. And I found technology fascinating, but I didn't want to be a person who was back in the 90s, you're banging out code in front of a computer terminal. That didn't really interest me. So I'm like, ah, 
we'll see if technology can get involved, but I want to do business stuff. So I ended up, you know, the first decade or so of my career kind of working in technology in financial organizations. So trading firms or research firms or investment advisory types of things. But I started building all of this technology and databases, and systems and things like that. And it was, wasn't because I wanted a career in technology. It was because this was a great tool belt to do things in business. And so while I'm surrounded by IT folks and database administrators and all of those people that love the technology for technology's sake, I loved the technology for business sake. And I had an opportunity during the market downturn in the late 2000s to go to an MBA program while I was working for a trading firm. And so the markets were going crazy around us. I'm working at a trading firm, seeing the volatility day in and day out. And I'm going to school at night, learning about the fundamentals of what makes business work. And from there, transitioned into a career in consulting. And it really became management consulting strategy and then data analytics on top of it because I had this technology background. I've been building these systems and now I was putting it all together to realize how businesses really need to function by using technology, by using data to improve what they do. Been consulting for many years, had an opportunity to be a chief data officer for the Chicago Transit Authority for a period of time. So that was really interesting. And then continued my consulting career and eventually got to the point where I'm like, you know, I've been doing all of this stuff and I seem to have a different perspective on this than anybody else. I really need to put this into a book. So I put it into a book. I had my framework. I had these things that I've been developing for decades and decades at this point. And I realized like there's something here and it really became like this application. It's like applied data analytics, applied data management. How do we take all these technology systems and data value and data artifacts and assets and all of this stuff and turn it into something that actually matters for businesses? And that's really what the book is about, what data leadership is about, and really what my business is about. Because I see so many organizations out there, like you walk into a boardroom, everybody gets it now. Yes, data is important. But what do we do about that? What is it that we actually take from this stuff that we just inherently now know is important? We see organizations around us being successful with it. How does that impact us? How do we do it? And that's really what my mission is about, is to help organizations that are going to have a tough time going forward if they don't solve this. I want to help them solve it. Yeah, well, I can hear the passion in your voice. So this is awesome. Let's start with an owner of a business whether they're preparing to sell their business or not. Being a business owner myself, I look at all the data that is swirling around just my office. Data is in multiple platforms. More and more, it's now cloud-based platforms. So data resides in so many different places. So if you're an owner of a business and you want to get your arms around data so that you can have all the proper information and take the right actions, how do you pull all of that together into a meaningful place so that you really can not only analyze it, but then make decisions based on it? Right. And I think that the key here is being pragmatic, recognizing that, hey, there's way too much data. It's funny because organizations will talk about, we need to monetize our data, data monetization, this and that. And you realize there's not a customer for that. There's no one who's walking around saying, you know what? I really could use more data, Mm -hmm. right? Everybody has got more data. We weren't even trying to get. And so what you need to think about is where does data value really come from? And that's the important thing. The important thing is to say, what makes data valuable? And really, the value of data only comes when it's applied to something, when it's used to drive a improvement in business process, where your business does something differently than it would have because of the analysis that you've done of the data. And that is really important because when you think about how does business create value, very simply, it's either you're going to increase revenue, you're going to increase your top line, you're going to decrease costs and your bottom line, or you're going to improve your risk management. And it's important to think about that separately because the time horizons and the measurements are different than just top line and bottom line. So if you think about in those three dimensions, and then you say, here's all the data that we have, and understanding that even that question could be somewhat daunting at times, here's the data we think we have. How might we use some of this to improve one of these other three things? And start to draw what that is. If you say, hey, you know, we have this database that's sitting on Susie's laptop over there and she takes that laptop home every day. Maybe we might want to make sure that laptop's encrypted. 
maybe we might want to make sure that our customer data isn't actually on that physical machine that's going back and forth on the train every day. Things like that are relatively simple. Like you don't have to do huge, enormous, multi-million dollar projects to get value out of data. A lot of times it's simple changes to how your business runs that allows you to move one of those needles in some sort of measurable way. And then as you start to do that more and more, you create bigger and bigger impacts. And that's really what should drive our efforts around data as opposed to saying, how do we become the next Uber? Or how do we become the autonomous car? It takes a lot of steps before you get there. Think about the next step you can take. And that's really where, how do we do one thing to improve the value that we're creating with the data that we have? I think that's really good practical advice because I, I do think data as a topic can be overwhelming. And I think a lot of people will push it off because there is so much to it. But if you take one thing and see how you can learn from that and improve it and then move on to the next thing, I think that's tremendous. So as it relates to M&A, how does the concept of data leadership or data itself factor into M&A transactions? Right. So I think the first and, and most obvious way is that data is risk. I mean, the data ineffectiveness represents an enormous risk to any business. And that includes a business that you're maybe looking to sell or maybe looking to buy. And that unknown, by having it unknown, represents something that you can't take real action on. You can't take measured action on. And so the important thing is to first be able to assess, hey, what is our data? What might that data look like in terms of its impact to revenue cost or risk? Should we be using it for what we could? Or where are there holes that if filled may represent business opportunities that could lead to a better price or lead to better outcomes for this organization that's functioning? Those are the kinds of things that I look at when I'm working with businesses to say, okay, where are there opportunities to leverage this in ways that maybe haven't been done so far? Or maybe just, it might be staring me in the face if I come in and help, but it may be completely oblivious to people who haven't really worked with data in this kind of capacity before. And that's what we see a lot of times, especially in these small and mid-sized businesses, they just don't have those resources on staff to be able to find those opportunities. Absolutely. So maybe to be illustrative here, because I always find that examples are a great way to get the point across. Can you think of a client that you've worked with where you came in and helped them with their data and as a result, either improved the value of their business or improved the sellability of that business because you did something with their data? Right. One of my favorite examples is when you look at and one thing I should note before I tell this is that the fewer kind of layers of abstraction, the fewer steps removed from actual business outcome you are by what you're doing with data, the more likely you're going to realize that actual value, right? So if you're doing something that needs 20 different people to take action before it leads to anything, it's probably going to be harder to achieve that versus if you say, if I understand this one metric, I can directly reduce my cost or directly increase my revenue. So I think one of the best examples, and probably easily relatable for most of your audience, is something as simple as a restaurant. So a restaurant could be the number of customers that they have on any given day is going to be really important for how much from a supply perspective they have, how many orders of bread or pies or whatever they make or and raw ingredients and things like that, there's a direct correlation, right, to cost. There's also a direct correlation to the cost of the staff. So if you're working in a restaurant environment and you notice, hey, some days we're really slow and we have way too many people on staff that are here, and some days we're just don't have enough people to go around, why might that be? Well, the number one, the first thing from a data perspective that I would want to look at is how does weather impact your business? Can we, and there's easily free sources of information out there saying, what was the temperature? Was it rainy or sunny? And look at your business. You probably have, I'm hoping you have some record of sales on a daily basis of what you've done. Can we correlate that simply to weather and get to a point where we could say with some degree of precision, hey, maybe today you should bring on one more person or maybe today that bubble person have them stay home or be on call, but don't have them come in and incur that cost. 
try to start tracking your costs more directly to a predictive, very simple predictive model of what might happen based on some externality that you can get data on. So weather's a great one. And in my opinion, every small business, even every family business should be looking at weather as a potential for how they kind of twist those knobs of their operations. Very interesting. Very interesting. So let's take it to the next step. So I know that you've been involved in post M&A transactions where a buyer was involved and maybe overlooked the data component and got you incorporated in the process afterwards. And you uncovered some interesting stuff, it sounds like. So maybe you can talk about some of those scenarios and we'll come back to best practices. Right. One of the early experiences that I had in this space kind of taught me a lot that I've used for now, embarrassingly long time. But I think it's so representative of what you see in the M&A space that I think it's still a good example. So I worked for a company at one period of time where they did a lot of acquisitive growth and they were buying other similar types of companies. This was in the financial space that they were effectively looking at it like so many M&A transactions are as buying cash flows, buying these customer accounts and the assets and then needing to incorporate them, service them with their larger service footprint. And hopefully everybody's just as happy and everything goes well. Well, I worked on, I was on a team that had to take whatever that acquired firm those customers used to get in terms of reporting and financial statements and that kind of stuff and get them into the new system without making them all mad so they leave. And so they had various different requirements. And if you just immediately transition them to the new system, they felt like they were just numbers. And those customers would go and the acquisition wouldn't be a good deal anymore because a higher percentage than predicted of customers would have left. So very much a data function, I had to come in and start to make reports, make customer-facing artifacts look just like they used to have, and then eventually over time, integrate them within the systems of the acquiring firm so that those customers stayed happy. And even though when you make that purchase at the firm level, you see them as numbers, you see them as cash flows, they are real people and they are going to leave if you can't continue to service them in a way that they would be accustomed to because it, change at any point is scary to people. And this is a really important you know, part of the data conversation is that data only creates this data value that we talk about by causing change, by changing business processes, by changing what your organization is capable of. Well, change is naturally scary to folks. And if you don't acknowledge and handle and treat that fear or that, that potential for unexpected consequences to the things that you do, then you can be missing out on a great amount of value in any kind of transaction because a transaction is potentially the biggest change organizations face. When you're bringing in a new firm or you're selling an organization, there's going to be risk of flight from your employees. There's going to be risk of flight from your customer base. There's going to be changes to how the business process works. And, and oftentimes for very good reason, because you want to make things more efficient or what have you. But that's where folks like me tend to get called because there's an acquiring firm will come in and say, hey, we bought this firm. We have no idea how to get them integrated into the parent organization. How do we do it? A lot of times they'll just leave them alone to function, but that doesn't maximize the value of the investment that they've made. Absolutely. So in that example that you cited with that financial firm, what should they have done differently so that you weren't scrambling after the acquisition got done to make clients comfortable? What advice would have you have offered them if they had involved you up front? Well, the first thing they should have done as part of the due diligence on just before the purchase was even made, it was to get a sense of how different from a culture perspective the client base was of the firm being acquired. And that would have given them some insight, hey, we're going to need to devote some resources to making sure this is a smooth transition for them. Because that's what really matters in the value of the business is what do those customers expect? What do those customers need to be successful? Because we need to make that as smooth as possible. And so the fact that they didn't even think about that until the firm had already been acquired and customers started leaving, we had missed out on a tremendous amount of time that we could have been doing good things to make them stay. Like we were in triage mode when we were trying to help transition them more effectively versus we could have been much more proactive 
and strategic in how these organizations came together. And I think there's a risk a lot of the time because things move fast and people want to make the transaction happen. They don't stop and think, what is the real work involved in making the most out of this once it's done? And hopefully if we start doing that before the transaction, before we even have a buyer, if the seller is thinking about how do I maximize the value of this business that I've spent my life's work creating, get on top of that. And it's a personal thing. It's a data thing, certainly, but it's about the core functions of your business and how they might change once this business changes hands. I think it's a really good point. Understanding how you might have to change and adapt is so important. And a sponsor of the show, the Keystone Group, they specialize in integration. We've talked a lot about this. Do your integration discussions early and often because that will make or break the success of the transaction on the back end. And certainly when it comes to data involving people like you who are experts at this will only make for a smoother transition and a higher likelihood that the transaction is going to be successful. Absolutely. And, and at minimum, try to bring in even just some baseline analysis into your diligence process, whatever that looks like. Just spend a little time saying, how does data factor into this and where are the opportunities here? And if you don't have that on your internal team, hire a consultant, hire somebody who can help you do that. But think about those things up front because it will be a competitive advantage if you're on the buy side and you can look at that prior to actually formalizing the deal, you're going to have information that potentially other buyers won't. And until this becomes commonplace, I think there's a huge opportunity for acquiring firms to understand what they're purchasing better than a lot of the competitors out there. So in that regard, Anthony, are there tools that are available to people, whether it's you know an owner of a business who wants to maybe get their arms around data or an acquirer who wants to better analyze the data? Are there tools that people can apply that easily allows them to evaluate the quality of the data that's there today? I think it comes back to kind of sort of your traditional maturity model, maturity assessment types of functions, because it's really not so much about the tools. I think we actually look at the tools a lot. We look at what the artifacts are, but the important thing isn't the artifacts themselves. Like look at the size of databases or the applications you're using. That's somewhat helpful, but the important thing is the story. The important thing is what is this data actually mean? What does it actually do? Where are the holes? Do people think their data is terrible? And finding a way to understand some of those stories, I don't think there's a tool that can do that because every organization's makeup and the systems that they're using or the way they work with data or the way they don't work with data, those are the kinds of things that really come from looking at the operations. It's more of an operation and business process analysis type of function, I think, versus being something where we could say, here's a profiling tool that could show us all of that because it needs to pull out a story. I don't know of a tool that could do that. Even the AI and machine learning types of models might give you some quantitative analysis that would certainly be helpful, but it would be supplementary to the actual story of the data versus the kind of artifacts that you're seeing just measured directly. Yeah. You know, with so much of our data now moving into the cloud with all these SaaS-based companies and applications that are being adopted by businesses every day. I mean, when I look at our business, I mean, we must have seven or eight different cloud-based solutions for different parts of our business. With the movement towards, you know, the cloud, is that going to change the way that people are analyzing their data or will it change anything? Or will these companies actually start to get involved in helping you analyze your data? Because I know today, none of them do. They provide the application and they're great at providing the application, but they don't really help when it comes to analyzing the data. This is such a classic challenge because the folks that are building these cloud-based or as-a-service solutions, what sells those is the functionality that they're providing. So they focus their time and attention on giving you the best functionality possible. Then as an afterthought, they'll add in some reporting because they know you need that, but that's not what makes the decisions for people. Like people don't make their decisions based on the reporting that comes out of one of these tools. They make it based on the functionality inside of the tool. And so I think 
it's probably at a point where people are starting to have higher demands on that reporting function, but it's still to the point where you're not making those decisions that way. And the software companies are, are responding to that. But in a bigger sense, I think one of the challenges is making sure that when you create data and you're using a online tool, make sure you're not getting into deals where you can't get to that data underneath. One of the things that I find striking, and it's always found me striking, even with on-premises applications and things like that, is that a lot of times they want to charge you more to get access to your own data. And in in the 2000s, 2020s and beyond, that's not acceptable. Like you need to be able to have unfettered access to your data at all times for whatever you want to use it for. And ownership, right? Absolutely. Because there's some platforms that want to co-own your data. Yeah. And to me, that's a deal breaker. But I mean, to a lot of folks, they don't even know to ask that question up front. But that to me is something that is non-negotiable. You need to have unfettered, complete access and ownership to your data at all times. And then what you can do and what's so important, and this is the general rule, if you have an application of any kind, on-premises, off-premises, doesn't really matter, and you want to get insights from just that application, chances are the built-in reporting tools for that application are going to be sufficient. Once you want to combine that information with information from another system or multiple other systems, that's when you're going to want to get to a more standalone analytics solution or a data warehouse or something that's pulling information from a bunch of different places and specializes in that kind of mashing them together and giving you an ability to do analytics on that combined set of information. And that's really where a lot of the value is because your operational reporting, your operational metrics are built into systems and you get a decent of knowledge from that. It's when you start to look at things, how does this thing that I do in system A over here impact what we're doing in system B over here and then impacting our net revenue at the end of the day? Those kinds of things. And Anthony, I'm assuming that's where you would come in for a lot of business owners. You would come in and and help them wade through really what's important if they're not capturing the right data, helping them understand how to capture the right data and consistently capturing that data. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. It's a core thing that we do. We help them build the systems or at least point them in the right direction of applications and tools that can help them do those things. But what we find is what's most impactful is helping organizations learn the process, learn, hey, how do I take analytics, things that are interesting and turn them to things that actually matter? Because one of the things that we see, and we see this in companies big and small or what have you, it's people do things that are interesting. They're like, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to dig into these numbers or whatever. And then you're very interested and you saw this interesting stuff and you saw the line go up and down and whatever. And then that sits there and it doesn't do anything else. And that you got to get past interesting. You've got to get to action. You've got to get to a change in business process that drives one of those three measures that we talked about earlier. Because until you do that, you're just buying toys. You're doing interesting things, but you're procrastinating from what really matters, which is making your business better. And that's those connections, teaching that mentality, helping people navigate all of the complexity. We do all of that. But the most important thing is say, learn something that can help you do something that you couldn't do before. Find where those are and go from there. Absolutely. That's great advice. So Anthony, as we get ready to wrap up here, are there any parting thoughts or comments that you would leave with the M&A Unplug community as it relates to data and potential M&A transactions? I would say find ways to apply data in even the simplest ways and do it now. Recognize that every business needs to be in the data business. And if you're not, you're missing opportunity and you may be at real risk competitively in the very near future if it's not already happening. And so I think that what this is, is a wake up call to just start digging into it, find a way to look into it and remember that your data is your business. It is your business. It's not part of your business. It's not something that could help your business. It is your business. It is that truth under what you really do. And if you can learn how to look at it and use it to your advantage, you can make that future prospects for your organization that much better, regardless of where you are in the journey, whether you're buy side, sell side, middle of a transaction, start to get smart around data and you're going to do good things and protect things and help your future of your organization really be as successful as possible. It's great advice good information. You'll be a lot smarter and it'll make for a much better transaction. Anthony, this has been wonderful. If people wanted to get in touch with you, how can they reach you? 
I'm all over the LinkedIn, Twitter, AJ Algman, but the easiest way is probably just email anthony at algman.com. And that's A-L-G-M-I-N, and that information will be in the show notes. Anthony, thank you again. Really appreciate you being here. Dominic, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. So m and Unplug community, just to recap a bit, you know, while this seems, data seems like a topic that's slightly off course from our typical discussions as it relates to M&A, it's really not, trust me, because I can tell you there's going to be a point in time in every transaction where buyers are going to want to dig in the information and you need to understand what that information is. You need to understand how you used it while you were running the business, how it can be improved. And from a buyer's perspective, you need to understand how to interpret that data and what you'll do with the business post-transaction in order to integrate it into your business more easily or move the needle. As Anthony mentioned, either you know moving the top line improving the bottom line or reducing your risk. So uh, it was tremendous information. Data is not something to be overlooked in an M&A transaction. And uh, this is tremendous information. Uh, I want to thank Anthony for being here today. All today's information will be available in the show notes. If you would like to learn more about the process of acquiring or selling a business, please visit our website at sunacquisitions.com or feel free to reach out to me at drinaldi at sunacquisitions.com. I look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of the M&A Unplugged podcast. And until then, please remember that scaling, acquiring, or selling a business takes time, preparation, and the proper knowledge. Thank you for joining us today on M&A Unplugged. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and recommend it wherever you get your podcasts. If you want more great information on how to scale, acquire, or sell a business, please visit our website at sunacquisitions.com.